on? Yeah? All right. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We are super excited to be talking about experimental philosophy today. We are sitting down with Jonathan Keats. Thank Hello. you for coming on to our show. Very happy to be here. We really appreciate it. And your background is freaking awesome. We are going to be exploring all of the experimental philosophy that you've been doing, or as much of it as we can fit. And also, what's the point of it? Why is it so important? And where are we going to go in the future with more experimental philosophy? So let's ask, like, what is experimental philosophy, and how did you get started in it? Well, I studied philosophy academically in, in college and found that it was not exactly what I expected. I had some sort of a naive notion that it was being Socrates, going around asking big questions and engaging everybody in the, in the conversation. But it turned out, particularly because I was studying analytic philosophy, which is a particularly persnickety pursuit, that in fact, what was expected was a narrow subsection of a small segment of a question that was minuscule that could be worked on for an entire lifetime. And that's just the nature of specialization in any academic pursuit. So, of course, this is the sort of thing that I could talk about perfectly well with three people in the same department, but not my mother, not anyone out on the street. And so it was ultimately failing to accomplish what I wanted to achieve, which was I'm motivated by curiosity fundamentally. I basically, I just never bothered growing up. I didn't realize that I was supposed to do so. And I finally figured out that I hadn't and that it was much better that way. So I'm curious and interested in trying to bring others into, back into the sort of state of childhood where yep. all possibilities are open and where everything is interesting and everything can be explored. And it can be explore, explored experimentally. It can be explored in ways that are indeterminate. So essentially what I did was I, I left, I got my degree, figured that might as well at least get that far with it. And then I, I escaped and went out into the world to try to figure out how do I go about what I thought philosophy is and what I thought philosophy does, or really more generally, what I think philosophy ought to do. And everything that is done in academia is perfectly legitimate, but at the same time, I think is insufficient in our society, particularly given that our society is necessarily a society in which people are engaged in questioning, in critically engaging the function of the society because ultimately collective self-determination is what democracy is all about. So combine my selfish childhood interest in just pursuing curiosity with some sort of a rather grandiose mission to try to bring people into a state of questioning and of conversation and of critical thinking. And you end up in some weird nebulous world where I ended up, which is the art world. And I ended up there only because it's probably the only space in society right now that has moved in the opposite direction of specialization that you find throughout academic pursuit. So not only in philosophy, but also when you think about in the sciences, for instance, it's necessary to specialize because the body of knowledge upon which any current study is built is so vast that you necessarily can't learn it all in advance. So in order to do the science, you become a specialist. Art, on the other hand, has gone from specialization where you had a vocation, you had a métier in, let's say, sculpture, and you learned very specific techniques, to a crisis that happened through Dada, through Marcel Duchamp, basically bringing a urinal and showing it as an artwork, and therefore effectively proclaiming that art is undefinable and that the undefinability of it is its virtue, one interpretation amongst many, one that I happen to like, that that then led to a sort of a crisis, an existential crisis within, within the arts that have allowed for absolutely anything to happen. And so a lot of what has happened as a result has been a sort of rather boring, in my opinion, and somewhat, uh, somewhat abstruse 
recapitulation of that moment of rebellion, but it also meant that I could go into the art world, make use of the mechanisms, and I could undertake what I think of as large-scale thought experiments. So basically... What's a, what's a recalipulation? A what, recal what is that? <laughs> a recalipulation. Yeah. I, it's a great term. I, I have never come across it before. I, I think Ron was uh, referring to a word that you said uh, just a couple moments ago, but that has also slipped my mind as well. But um, you were on a very mm. awesome stream of consciousness right there. And uh, there was, I want to, I want to, we'll be right where we, you left off, but I want to bring us back sure, to where you started course. and then we'll come right to where you left of off. Course. Okay. So you brought us into this world of curiosity the importance of curiosity for the young child's mind. And we have a, there's been so many of these examples. Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about the one where a child whips out a bunch of pots and pans from the cabinets and just starts hitting them with stuff and then the parent goes, stop. Mm -hmm. The parent can't say stop there. You gotta say play. The mm -hmm. parent's gotta sit down with the kid and start playing with the kid as well. That this sort of curiosity where the child's running around through through the grass and through the plants and of course trying to not get poison ivy and trying mm -hmm. to not get harmed or in any way but still at least be able to explore freely with their curiosity that is the uh, and in, in now like you were describing retaining that through adulthood and Pablo Picasso talks about the importance of retention of childhood mm -hmm. through adulthood and if we can unlock that inner child innate curiosity within us through life it changes us forever for the better and now that's so great that you were describing how in, in academia and even just now in general, we have such broad volumes of knowledge across all of these different fields that a majority of what we have to do sometimes to, to specialize or to get involved is we have to go and read those volumes of knowledge. If I want to get into neuroscience, I have to go and read about, I have to try and apply the Pareto principle and find the 20% of the most important neuroscience knowledge that's going to give me 80% of the knowledge that I need in neuroscience and then spend as much time there and then go and figure out what I want to do in neuroscience. And so what you, know, what you were able to describe here now is that with experimental philosophy, you're taking the, what, what is normally known as just going and, and specializing and, and just kind of following a, a path that so many people follow and just flipping it on its head. And this is kind of what we've been doing in the past, but we haven't been doing it to the extent that you have across different disciplines as well. And I like how you said in art that we were just at MoMA a couple months ago. And I took a photo of those, you know, there's like a red triangle and like a green square and like a white circle and a yellow, uh, whatever, pentagon or whatever, and they're on the walls. And I took a photo I of that. Talking about, talk about the Solowit? Um, you would know Wall much drawings. better. Mm. You would know much better what I'm talking about. You're so much more fluent in this than I am. But I took a photo of that and I posted mm. it to social media and I just said like, what does this modern art mean to you? Mm -hmm. I was just inquiring about what people thought about it. But you were describing how art has went through this kind of phase where art can just be whatever now. The urinal on the wall, the green square, you know, whatever it wants to be. But there's something deeper. There's a deeper seed in, um, in Picasso's art. Uh, and in um, Escher's art, um, there's these deeper seeds of something that is screaming towards the world of profundity. And I want to uncover what profundity? that is. Profundity? Some what profound. is that word? Something that is profound. You know, we got to reach the less educated people. Profound. This stuff Some, is important. Something you know? that's profound. That's the most profound. Something that's very profound, something that um, basically is extremely interesting or intriguing. Mm. So, um, so now maybe we come to this point where you just were at the, or do you have any, you have want to comment let, on the way? Let me then kind of backtrack a little bit to, I think, a really important point that you brought up about parents not only losing their own sense of play, but also trying to discourage children from doing so. And so I think that we are in an even worse situation than maybe I was suggesting at the outset in terms of the fact that we just don't allow time for play. We don't think that it's legitimate for ourselves when we grow up. And then we go about trying to professionalize childhood and that's just really catastrophic. So absolutely worth emphasizing that point I would say to begin with. And then to say that in terms of the 
the art world, I think that there is a reaction to much modern and contemporary art that is adverse to that work, that is negative, because often the work is intentionally made opaque or inaccessible. And I just want to emphasize that that's not what interests me in terms of what I do. I'm very interested in that work in its own right, and it's legitimate, it has its own reason. But when I say that I've entered the art world, I've only done so in some sort of a completely opportunistic way. When I'm asked what I do for a living, I sometimes say experimental philosopher, but then I say, well, really, I'm a dilettante. Really what I'm... What's a dilettante mean? A dilettante is somebody who, so it's generally an insult, and at least in our society an today. Insult. An insult. In, an insult? An insult. So, so, so calling somebody a dilettante. Incel as an involuntary celibate? No, no, insult. Insult, I-N-S-U-L-T. In, yes, as insult. in, okay. I spit in your face. Oh, that's so what a dilettante is. Or you sh- tiny brained wiper of other people's bottoms. So I dil- fart in your general direction. So dilettante it, is... Is um, like a charlatan? Yes, a dilettante, a okay. charlatan. Also, okay. the word amateur gets used in this way now in, in a way that is meant as an insult. I actually take all of these as a compliment because to me, these are the keys to generalism and to the ability to, as a generalist, put... It, put things together in unconventional and unexpected ways, in ways that they otherwise might not be, and to illuminate them from other perspectives as a result. So really, I think that I use the art world opportunistically sometimes as a space in which I can get away with doing whatever I want. It's kind of black sheepy, a little bit of uh, Copernicus-y. You're trying to find this 1%, 0.001% that nobody's exploring. And why is it so fascinating? How can you make that more interesting for other people? Well, I think the art world is maybe more, I mean, we're in a studio here. There's a green screen right over there. So, well, it's a green piece of cloth, I guess, if it serves a purpose. Yeah. Green screen. But the art world is almost yeah. essentially, a, for me, a green screen. It's basically, it's a, it's a space that is neutral, that allows me to to do what I want. And what I want to do is to undertake what I call thought experiments. Yeah. And so that is essentially more than anything else what I have smuggled out of academic philosophy. So I went into academic philosophy thinking, okay, this is all about asking big questions, provoking those conversations that when you hear vaguely about Socrates, that was the sort of thing that he was up to. So. What academic philosophy taught me was, amongst other things, a mode of argumentation. The mode of argumentation is essentially that you lead your opponent along through a set of stages in a scenario that ultimately your opponent is agreeing to until it reaches a crisis point, a a state of absurdity. And therefore, your opponent is caught up in that and has to surrender. Well, this is dependent on a number of things. First of all, trickery, which I'm not particularly fond of. And secondly, of having a point, making an argument where you effectively are attempting to persuade somebody. And I, so I never had a point. I was never interested in a point. The other strand, as far as my background is concerned, that I think is significant is I I come out of a, I'm interested in, in Talmudic practice of questioning of what's Talmudic so the Talmud was Talmud. and remains a central book in Judaism a central body of of law in Judaism but the practice is one in which you are constantly in a process of questioning it's also yes. sometimes we love questions here equivalent to a dialectic to we love a Judaism Hegelian dialectic. too <laughs> I just want to say that I love the JCC absolutely and there should be more of this sort of questioning in every possible way. And for me, the thought experiment actually can be a mechanism for doing that as opposed to what it gets used for in academic philosophy. That is to say, instead of using it rhetorically, what if I were to take it literally? And I take most things literally as a starting point in order to be able to then examine all the assumptions that go into this more sophisticated way in which we 
we use ideas, we use mechanisms, we operate within our society. So I want to get underneath this society, inside the society in every way that I possibly can. And that can be experimentally. So what I do is instead of how I was just envisioning right now me having a like uh, some sort of a, a toy here that I could just pull a string and it would shoot a bunch of like confetti out mm. and then I would you know throw a beach ball out into the audience and then do you know this yes. is the experiment and then just have watch the audience go whoa and then you'd continue your point and they'd be hitting the beach ball or something so these different ways to rather than just sitting here and talking let's do something crazy and fun and cool with it as well yes yeah, so let, let's see what happens so what if is the fundamental question that I'm asking in whatever it is that I do. There are other questions as well, but what if? So I can set up an alternative world that is in fact absurd perhaps in some way, and I can, instead of using that as an argument for saying, well, okay, I led you on, you believed it, you're dumb, and I'm right, instead I can say, let's enter into this alternate reality and use it as a vantage to look upon our own world. And of course, this is something that you find in literature throughout history. This is what fable does, what folklore does, and right in the present, to, um, in a, for more contemporary um, viewers, listeners, and readers, what science fiction does. But I want to do it in an experiential and open-ended way. So that is to say that I set up a world that we can enter into collectively and we can experience it. We can use that as a way in which to be able then to reflect on our own world. So to give you an example, and I want to, I want I'm going to, so, I'm I want going to, to say something so bad right yes. now. And can we get to your example? You were you were describing the uh, this sort of way that we traverse conversation, the dialectic, mm. and dialogue between two people. And you were explaining how one person will be giving this scenario, and you're talking about it again right now, just painting this world, and then all of a sudden there will be this crisis point. And, mm -hmm. and, that, and that could be the moment when the other person says, I agree with you on that crisis point, or I don't agree with you because of this, or you know what, I'm gonna hit the tennis ball back with a little bit of spin in the, mm -hmm. into this intellectual tennis ball. And then you're also describing something interesting here is this painting the world. So if I'm, in, if I'm painting you a world, this is a one that you know, I'm recently been kind of interested in, is what does the world look like once, um, once it's indistinguishable to tell between a human and an artificial intelligence uh, completely right. at, at the bar or at the museum or wherever you're walking around. And once it's indistinguishable at that point, then now the idea is when we paint a world like that, are we now the question is what are we trying to say by that are we trying to say that this is a, an important foresight to have we should analyze this and be weary of it and be ready for it and explore what it looks like or are we trying to say like oh my god this is fearful this is a crisis point oh my gosh so you can be kind of painting this world for people with an intention of them maybe looking at ourselves in the mirror in the present moment or thinking about the future is it fear is it is it happiness and prosperity? Right, and, and this is, I think, in the case of most science fiction, u utopian, dystopian, it has a spin. It has a very particular way in which it's trying to make an argument once again. And this is certainly true of fables when you think about Aesop's fables, for instance. And so there's a moral at the end. He actually didn't write those morals, but nevertheless, that's how we receive them today. And that's, that has its role, it, it, as does argument, as does an impassioned position, which as long as that impassioned position is not ultimately a prejudice, can in fact function within society at large in a useful way in terms of allowing for counter positions to build upon it. And also getting us somewhere. Ultimately, we have to decide to do something versus something else. So ultimately, we need to make some sort of a decision. But what I'm interested in is how do we have this experimental space, this possibility space, where it is not predetermined that this is meant to comment one way or another. So I'm not interested in satire as far as what I do. I'm not interested in parody. I'm not interested in polemic. What's I'm, polemic? I'm not interested in making an argument, uh, ah. polemically speaking, ma making an argument for the sake of 
Proving a point. Proving a point or persuading you is probably more what I'm speaking Interesting. to. So you. the experiments that you're running are just for play to the point of science or technology or inquiry in just general? Well, I think that they are spaces in which play is a, an important aspect of it. And some may be more playful than others. Some may enter into a space that I create and they might then play within that space. Role play, for instance, or otherwise try out different possibilities within that space. Others might simply come upon it through other means, through the media. I always run a media campaign around a project in order to get it into as large a space of discourse as possible, which really I think relates to what, what you're up to here. Is exactly. How do we, how do we get ideas and thinking into as large a space engaging as many people as possible. And that is where I think we have a mission in common. Yes, we do. Yes, so, we do, Jonathan. Should we put, bring up some of the ones that you've done? Sure, I, so I, I think that that would be a good way in which to make what probably is completely confusing and opaque in its own right, perhaps a little bit more grounded. Yes, and we have this insane amount of noise now because there's so much data, there's so much information now, it's hard to parse for signal. And we spend so much of our time running around in the economic and political machine, it makes it difficult to slow down, find space and time to just think. Absolutely, and I think that because it's devalued to slow down and just think, that we don't build the mechanisms that make the time. So at this stage in history, in the economic political system in which we live, it's almost a subversive act. And yeah. it's almost, I think, a matter of, because there, there are legitimate reasons why most people cannot spend their entire lifetime in thought, or even can spend days of the week doing what I do. I happen to have managed to find ways in which to do it and to survive on that basis. Yes. It's rare and it's a privileged position and I don't want to inflict that privilege on others or to, um, to, to restrict those who participate in this because you need a certain level of privilege in which to do so. So rather what I'm trying to do is to say... But you live quite to, humbly in order to... In, yes. and make that ability happen for but yourself. But even so, humbly in a first world kind of way. So I need to be honest with yeah. myself. But I believe that everybody can find five minutes out of the day to get out of whatever they need to do in order to be able to survive, yeah. in order to really, to really live and to ultimately contribute to that longer term survival that's only possible if we are engaged in deep thought about who and what we are, what we want to become, and how we can do it collectively in a way that is not going to be toxic to others. Well, what good is that going to do the, to the rules of the world that do not want us thinking critically and <laughs> taking time away from this big picture of ours and saying, hey, what's going on here? This makes absolutely no sense. I have so much more in my mind other than this elementary, systematic, oppressive state that we live in. And there's so much more to explore in the human mind than that elementary fundamental state that sometimes it feels like we're prisoned yeah, into. Yeah, no shit. We're just prisoned in there sometimes. So, okay, so let's take this, um, this idea of uh, experimental philosophy and tinkering and playing to play and playing to explore and having enough time to do so. And let's see how we can form large scale events and large scale thought experiments and, and, and showcase that play and inspire, for, and inspire more. We have to redesign the social fabric a little bit to enable people to take that five minute break more often. We, just... we should, we, we, don't have, we don't have to do that first. I think that what I do is highly, deeply imperfect, flawed in any number of ways, but I think at least it does prove Likewise. that you can 
do something. Why are you so hard on yourself? Your what your work is fascinating, and and it's it's because because it's it's a it's a state of humility to say that. Hey, like I understand, I en- I enjoy but give that. yourself some props there. But it, it is good, it, exactly. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, so, so bef- I want to make sure that we get to all of the different things that we yes. need to talk about. Yes. Um, one of them on the way to you being able to do these experiments is the fact that you don't have a cell phone. You yes. you have a landline and you have email. Mm-hmm. And and this is this is another you're now the second person I know. The first person's Aubrey de Grey. He chooses to not have a cell phone because he calls it the ultimate destroyer of of human solitude or of personal solitude. Now, will you explain to us why you do choose to not have a cell phone? I think that it's a broader question of technology and my relationship to it. I'm not a, I'm not opposed to it. I'm certainly not a Luddite. I'm also not a technophile. Correct. I don't Correct. inherently because, well, first of all, everything is technology. Every artifact certainly counts as technology. A hand axe is technology as much as a cell phone. Yep. And I can choose what I want to use as a way in which to choose how I want to live and who I want to be. And so a cell phone simply has never seemed essential to me. And Why? then. Why? Well, I'm here, and yep. clearly I didn't die as a result of not having a cell phone. Clearly, yeah. I didn't yeah. even feel the urge to have a cell phone. Yeah. I, I think that there's a way in which not having a cell phone at least allows me to escape, allows me to do for myself what Aubrey de Grey would argue everyone needs to do. And I would agree, everybody needs that, whether they need to use those means and whether vilifying one or another technology totally. is legitimate, that, that's where I respectfully disagree with him. I don't think that a cell phone is evil. Yeah. I do think that I don't need one and that there are many other technologies that we don't necessarily need. I've never owned a car either. I don't need a car. You know, that's, not, that's not what we were thinking at 5.30 when we were looking for you there, Jonathan. You know, I just want to say that. You know, I, I just throw sure, that in there. Sure, so, so I don't think Aubrey either vilifies it, but mm. in, in this extent of everybody, 99.99999% of humanity has a cell phone the, of the developed world, let's say, and then 0.0001% of people like you just chooses not to own one. And then there's this amazing area in between, which is I know how to put my phone on silent and not look at it for extensive periods of time so I can focus. So mm-hmm. there is, or airplane mode, there's these different kind of media points and, and as well. Certainly, and actually I created a work for cell phone. I created a ringtone some years ago, back when custom ringtones were just becoming popular. Yep. It, was, it was silent. So it was four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. John Cage, one of the great avant-garde composers of the 20th century, composed a work that changed everything in music, which was a work that was four minutes and 33 seconds of silence that was performed in all earnestness in a concert hall on piano in the early instantiations of it where the performer did not play for those four minutes and 33 seconds. And didn't seconds. even move their hands, they just sat there on the, and just were quiet for four minutes, 33 seconds, and yes. then just stood up and bowed. Yes, and you can do it in any number of different ways, yeah. but my thought was, well that's analog. I can do it digitally, I can make it even I can make a better silence in a certain sense. Also, it's not portable. I mean, grand piano? Not portable. Exactly. So a cell phone as a mechanism for making silence is really interesting to me because we live in a world that's so noisy, as you say. So what happens if you have on your body at all times silence? And that silence can manifest at any time and you don't even know when it's manifesting. Even on a crowded bus, somehow you can put something on that go Your phone makes, go could be ringing. Sound. No, it isn't even that. It isn't even a matter of trying to somehow shut yourself out. It's a matter of the fact that the silence is happening in addition to whatever else is happening and that that silence can, in fact, mm. not be happening because maybe nobody's calling you, but maybe you think somebody's calling you. So maybe the, it's a phantom silence. It's even yeah, more of yeah. a a way in which to silence your mind, a way yes. in which to, to get out of the noise that is busyness, that is yeah, yeah. running around, that is constantly being 
on others schedule exactly um, that is a very good point it's that when somebody sends you a message or sends you a call or sends you an email it is not your responsibility to be on their schedule and pick up the call or answer the message or answer the email and actually it's more often better to turn off those expressions those genetic expressions let's call them and turn off that people network turn it off and very rarely actually pick it up or respond because there are again apply the Pareto principle only a certain amount and this is this manifest that I just released today, that that is exactly what we need to start yeah. focusing on doing more. Okay, let's get to these points. So we got uh, one of the thought experiments that you've done is the travel documentary for plants. So yeah, so this is probably a good way in which to illustrate and so yeah, what a thought experiment is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it's it's a relatively simple case. So, I see a projector and some plants in this photo. So I'm going to just back up a little bit and say that this is not where this project began, okay. but rather the project began with thinking about getting into filmmaking. A lot of people are already doing it. There's no sense in me trying to compete with James Cameron. So I thought to myself, well, what audience might I reach that was not being catered to by Hollywood or any other yep. um, producers out there? And I thought, well, you know, plants. Plants are actually an ideal audience for film because film, what is it? It's light. So pro plants perform photosynthesis. So projecting light directly onto their foliage would be a way in which they would be able to experience film, perhaps to an even greater extent than we can do. So that led me to think about what do you do? What kind of movies do you make? And I started out as many filmmakers okay, do. Okay, so the idea is that if you project light onto plants, mm -hmm. that they will absorb that light yes. uh, at photosynthesize. And yes. that that could that they could feel or enjoy the light in different ways than we do, perceptually, well, via eyes. Yes, different ways, but also potentially in ways that are, are not different. And that's where it gets interesting. So I started out okay. in pornography. It's often where filmmakers get their start. I did so by filming honeybees pollinating flowers. I projected that directly onto the foliage of the plants, allowed them vicariously to experience the titillation of shadow play of honeybees hovering. Well, mm -hmm. that's not really pornography, though. Why is it not pornography? It's because it's honeybees. <laughs> well, you're not a plant. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> plants, that's pornography. Exactly. <laughs> Put yourself in the position of a plant. And partly, I think that's what I'm interested in, is what happens when we do that. Yes. So then I decided to make travel documentaries for plants. So go legit. So how are you going to make a travel documentary for a plant? You're probably not going to show the plant the Eiffel Tower. Not going to be that interesting. Not going to show the Golden Gate Bridge. But foreign skies. That could be interesting. So I filmed skies in Europe and then projected them onto the foliage of plants in New York. And again, I had to think about how do I not anthropomorphize? How do I make this true to the plant's yes. experience? Yes. So the first was shadow play for the pornography because that's really what's happening. You've got the sun, Clouds. the plant, yeah. and you've got basically honeybees hovering. In the mm -hmm. case of... Mm -hmm. The sky, you have clouds, but plants don't focus the light. They don't see clouds as forms. So that's why in this picture here, you can see a scrim, a projector projecting through a scrim, illuminating the plants with the aggregate light. So this is yet another sort of movie for plants. And I've subsequently made a third that I just released at a film festival at CERN in Geneva. Yep. And that was to make sci-fi for plants. So I took the spectral signature of different stars and then allowed plants to travel from Earth to Gliese 581D and to do so passing different star systems along the way and ultimately to go from a sunrise on Earth to a sunset, simulated obviously, as I couldn't actually get to Gliese 581D, a simulated sunset on this exoplanet that is largely believed Yes. Right now to be a place where life could subsist. Yes, so, we love exoplanet science. And so, okay, so you were trying to uh, move plants to exoplanets for them to feel like what would it be like to absorb the other stars' light? Vicariously, like yes. And That's so, interesting. And so all of this, I think, becomes... And you expanded the awareness of people, in again, in a new way. You were like, what would it be like for a plant to be there? Just like what it would be right. for a human to be there as well. Well, and, and even more basically, what is this thing that we do when we go into a theater or we watch television or we look at anything on a screen. How, how are we processing this and to what extent are we even aware of the fact that there are differences, not better or worse, but differences between mediated experience on a screen and experience out in the world. So a lot of questions potentially get asked and the idea is for me 
I just, I, just you have a, I just noticed you have a watch, so you do keep track of, of yes. time. In it. Okay. Indeed, and, okay. and many of my projects actually are about time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in this case in saying, what happens when we get outside of ourselves? I need to make the best movies I can for plants. I need to make it absolutely rigorously. I need to think through how not to anthropomorphize those plants yes. in order for us then to encounter the plants undergoing this experience that's very familiar to us in a way that is defamiliarized yes. and is absurd. Yes. And that absurdity is a space of disorientation that potentially brings us back around to asking ourselves about how we receive and how we process reality. Our own inputs. Exactly. And our own sensor, our own sensory systems and our own systems of cognition. I don't want to claim this I, there's, there's a whole field of plant neurobiology, which is somewhat a misnomer and problematic for that, but it is in, in fact the case that plants somehow process their world. They wouldn't be here if they didn't. So what can we learn about this more general state of processing the world, and how can that make us more aware of the ways in which we're doing so that may be different from the ways in which others are doing so that may make us more aware of others, more of a a theory of mind in the broadest possible sense of the word, and also maybe more of a sense in which we are able to find commonalities. And in a world that is increasingly toxic to other species, to other organisms, we this is desperately, your film? Yeah. desperately need. No, so this, this is, is just this pornography. Is, this is kind of a pornography. Exactly. So we need to strip out all the color. If you go onto YouTube, actually, you can find the trailer for that piece, and it was, uh, it was, so if you look up uh, plant pornography, probably isn't a whole lot there. Uh, it was, I don't know, 2006, 2007, put my name in as well. Um, I think you're gonna find a, a trailer for the original version of that, and uh, yes, yeah. so Cinema Botanica. Uh, that was Pornography for God, that's a different story. So um, if you go back, I mean, we can talk about that as well, but... I'm sorry, back. I didn't mean to just, you know... No, this is, this is interesting. What do you want me to do? So go Turn back to the other... To, uh, where you could select and then click instead on the other video, the pornography, so Cinema Botanica. There you go. So it was a while ago because they're embedding a screen within a screen here. So uh -huh. as you can see, basically what I've done is I thought through how do I make it so that the porn is as true to a plant's eye view of the world and then to ask to what extent is that experience meaningful to the plant as a way of asking where we derive meaning in our own lives, but also as a way of trying to ask what we have in yeah. common, what differences we have and how we navigate that. How do we relate? to other species yes. in ways other than how we are doing so right now, which is largely by bulldozing <laughs> and by uh, ignoring at best, but generally speaking, by dominating the planet in a yeah. way that is ultimately unsustainable to Correct. other species and also to us. Exactly. It's existential risk now, more yes. than ever, is how we treat it along the way. Um, okay, so let's take just one thing that you said from this and then kind of go on to the next one is just that this notion of the unfamiliarity. We have the familiarity of all of the sensory inputs, all of the cognition that we, see, we receive on a daily basis, and you enjoy really flipping it on its head or showing it in an unfamiliar way. Like, what would it be like to be a plant on another planet absorbing light from that star? What would it be like for us to be on that planet absorbing light from a different star? Or even and, something as banal as, as the sky. It, it doesn't need to be... What would it be like to have the sky in Australia right now instead of the United States? sky and and again you're we're just putting ourselves in unfamiliar places why is that interesting why is it interesting to um, to go into airplane mode for on your phone for long periods of time what would it be like um, to, to do mm -hmm. that same thing with our 10-day meditation retreats that we've been on we don't use cell phones we don't use technology no eye contact no speaking um, mm -hmm. for 10 straight days and when you do that and you tune inward for 10 days it's all you're flipping society on its head because mm -hmm. you're going away from all of the sensory inputs all away from the cognition and in order when you when one does that it's a profound shift in the way that we experience life and so it's and you can take yep. it with you it's not you just it then you. it's also what you carry as a result of having been there having done that exactly and then so the next one is this quantum wedding suite indeed so I was thinking about marriage and how it is kind of weird how some sort of authority 
political authority or religious authority gets to say what sort of relationship you are permitted to have with others or with another, actually, as a Totally agree with you. So my thought was, what if instead of basing it on some law of the land, we were to think about marriage in terms of some law that was more universal, a law of nature? Or the law of maybe what two people would want. Well, they can draft their own decision. Yeah, like a can, five year plan. You know, after yeah. five years, you can either renegotiate or give her the boot. Yeah, and we and, have friends that do that. They negotiate like monthly plans, monthly check ins. Yeah, month. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's just and, interesting. Some people want full life, some people might want only a couple year check in. But yeah. we need to get there. Or one night. And <laughs> in order to get there, I think we need to get out of the assumptions and the ways in which relationships are made legitimate through systems that are not flexible yep. and systems that are Dogmatic. not legitimate in their own right, perhaps. So my thought was, okay, yeah. law of nature. Well, quantum entanglement is a fascinating phenomenon that actually works very well in terms of you know, what, it, what does it mean to be together? Well, I can't think of any more married state than the state that two particles are in when they're in a, in a state of entanglement, where anything that happens to one of them instantaneously also happens to the other, effectively. So my thought was, how could I bring that into Las Vegas? Because Las Vegas is where, you, where people get married. So I, I opened a quantum wedding suite in Las Vegas in an old abandoned motel. And it was a place where and again, it's all about rigor at the outset and absurdity that results when rigor is applied in ways that then allow for anything to happen. So you're looking here at a nonlinear crystal, which is the means by which you entangle photons when you're running a lab experiment. And this apparatus also uses a, a beam splitter and by these means allows for two streams of entangled photons to bombard people who are standing in front of the apparatus. And that number can be any number that you like. It can be entanglement in any way that you choose. But ultimately, what is happening is by way of the photoelectric effect, that electrons are being entangled. Some part of you for some period of time, and it may be one electron, and it may be for less than a nanosecond, is most likely getting entangled with another or with others. And you can de define those terms in, in terms of who you bring into the room, what you do there, any way that you like. But, but it allows for a relationship that is not based on anybody saying, this is how it goes, and I confer this upon you. It's something that you can undertake. And the thing about it is, in, in the case of any quantum system, if you measure it, it collapses. If you measure an entangled state, it becomes disentangled. And I think that that's also an interesting way in which to be married ultimately is to be in a state where you're not measuring or questioning that state of togetherness. And that when you actually go about that measurement, if you doubt that you are entangled and you make the measurement to find out whether you are, you become disentangled. It isn't to say that, that that's how it needs to be, but it is to say that when you take this thought timer. experiment. Thank you, Ron. 15 minute timer. Okay. It's, uh, we're already we're at forty three. I would yeah, I would spend uh, so much would, time we, with. We would Jonathan. have a two hour episode. Yeah, on this one. I know. We'll, we'll have Jonathan come back for a part two at Jonathan, some point. Jonathan, what do you get for time tonight? Today, I we, mean, well, let's do can this you talk for like timer, three hours? You got You got to You got to go to Star Wars, Ronnie. So yeah, but I want to. I want. I really want to. Um, this is <laughs> this is so fascinating. <laughs> Jonathan, you're really a beautiful person. I'm just a little rough around the edges on the show. You know, I'm playing the devil's advocate, but uh, I think what I you do that is was my job. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, well, it we, is his we job. Have, Look at what he's doing right now. He's poking <laughs> apart <laughs> marriage. He's yeah. you're showcasing marriage from a new perspective, flipped on its head in different ways that is non-conventional. We love this type of stuff. So we'll have to absolutely revisit another episode where we dive deeper into all of this. But for now, let's continue exploring what is this importance of continuing to poke at things in different ways. Here we have the intergalactic omniphonics. All right, so orchestrating live music for, for life throughout the universe. Okay, so 
you, you are playing live music to other places in the universe. Not exactly. Okay. I'm actually so just trying, about to, it. trying to create the context in which you can perform music with any being anywhere in the universe without any of the assumptions or prejudices that are built into our own instruments, which is to say the ways in which we assume that all others are like us in terms of their sensory systems, in terms of their cognitive systems, what, what it would mean to set aside all those assumptions. And that becomes a basis for this much larger attempt on my part, a longer term project of trying to foment a Copernican revolution in the arts as a way of doing so in culture more generally. So yes. I'll come back around to this in a moment, but just to say in terms of the very big picture, I'm interested in how there was a Copernican revolution in the sciences 500 years 500 ago, years ago yeah. completely changed yes. everything, not just making for easier navigation, not just in terms of astronomy within our solar system, but the mediocrity principle, basically that we are no place special in place or in time. Yes, was the Earth is not the center of the universe. Exactly. Yeah. So my thought <clears throat> is that happened in the sciences, but it never went beyond the sciences. And we are mm. in our present society fundamentally Ptolemaic. That what is say, Ptolemaic mean? So the Ptolemaic system is, is a term that's typically used for the geocentric system, the system ah. that, that came before. It refers to Claudius Ptolemy, who was an astronomer who okay. didn't come up with it, but just kind of, he was okay. one of the people who elaborated on it and it gets his name. And so he gets vilified by all the Copernicans. So we treat as though almost every system, political, economic, astronomic, microscopic, all these different systems are somehow, we, these are just in, we we're at the to, middle of things. We're at the middle it, of it's things. It's all about me. It's all about, about it's, it's sort of concentric circles around myself, maybe my family, around my family, maybe my tribe, whatever that is, my country, my planet. So it, it's this way in which yes. rather than a Copernican worldview, which does not privilege me and does not privilege my nation. We are in a xenophobic state yeah. of tribalism, yeah. a state of being absolutely focused from the inside out. And what I want to do is I want to bring about that Copernican shift yes. in society in general. Yes. And I think that We're we with can you. do so potentially through the arts and through music in yeah. particular because it's popular because yes it is this yes, is a way is. in which what science could not achieve might through popular culture infiltrate our society and there might be some sort of a fundamental shift as a result of that so yes. i'm trying to do this very broadly by saying okay what if we get copernican about music that is to say what if we make music truly universal that is to say no assumptions whatsoever about anything particular to me or to us in the room or to us in this country or to us on this planet. So sensory systems. Well, in the first place, there's no reason to believe that the part of the sound spectrum that we hear, 20 to 20,000 hertz, is what any being anywhere in the universe would hear. In fact, dogs don't hear in the same way that we do. They hear up to 40,000 hertz. So already we know right here and now that it's much broader than that. So sound, however, might not be accessible to other beings. There's no reason to believe that every being has ears, every being throughout the universe. Yes, so the what senses we, have developed in different ways in different yes. places, yeah. So you can make music in many other ways, potentially. Music effectively touch. is... Yep. Well, I, I would say just as an even simpler way of thinking about this, the constituent parts of music are frequency and amplitude over time. So mm -hmm. any system that has frequency and amplitude and time allows for musical ideas to be expressed in ways that are equivalent to the music that we express using this 20 to 20,000 hertz range of, 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 of sound pressure. So that means visible light visible to us. But it also means infrared, ultraviolet, radio waves. Yes. It means gamma rays. So I've built yes. bells that are 
gamma ray bells that use radioisotopes. Mm. And the different radioisotopes have different spectral signatures, have different But we peak can't sense those. We, we can't. cannot directly sense those. And then so it's happening and we don't, we only know it's happening because you have started it, but that we don't, we can't feel it or see it or taste it or smell right. it. Right. And, and so, I mean, I start out actually in much simpler terms. I built an organ that is ultrasonic. I went onto eBay, I bought dog whistles and I turned them into an organ that is above our hearing range. The, the gamma ray bells use these different radioisotopes. I've also gone to an even greater extreme, or arguably, with gravitational waves. I get it now, intergalactic omniphonics. So I've created so a gravitational other, cello. So for other yes. places in the universe that have different perception abilities that are not that are very different than what we feel and see and touch, taste and smell, you are playing music for them. With them, so, ideally. Yeah, with them. So, so the idea is, I think, really, interesting. how do we have... We have some interesting people to introduce you to. How yes. do we have a dialogue? How do we have conversation? How do we have contact in ways that are not privileging us, that are not based on assumptions about us? And this is something that when you go all the way out there, if you, can, if you can do that, so if you can perform using in an, in an orchestra that has instruments that are not only audible to us, but also that are, that are actuating gravitational waves, then That's if you cool. think about That's cool. how mm -hmm. it is really, and we have the gravitational cello actually is one of our images here. Ronnie, can you throw up the gravitational cello image? That so, would be fantastic right now. So that that then is allows, so cool. That then allows yeah. for us to, it's, it's becomes, the aliens in our midst, How does this the work? border, How? it makes it so that it's that much more trivial to imagine having interaction with them. And I think that music as a mode of interaction, because yeah. it can be a jam session, it can be a sort of a spontaneous yes. way in which to interact with each other, yes. that it can be a very effective way in which to have that sort of open-ended dialogue. And so, yeah. and when you have this whole gamut of instruments, many of which are not immediately accessible to us, it then opens up this possibility space where all bets are off, where anything can happen, and also where we recognize that we may not know it all, we may not sense it all, that, that, that there might be other modalities. So there's a certain humility that gets built in, I think, which is yep. the opposite of the hubris, the xenophobia in our society, but it's also the inclusiveness, the radical inclusiveness that happens when you have this orchestra, which initially manifested at the University of North Carolina in Asheville, where I spent a semester as Black Mountain College Legacy Fellow, and then which I brought to San Francisco with intergalactic omniphonics, manufacturing instruments such as the gravitational cello. Yes. So to answer your question, how does it work? So very simply, gravitational waves We've only just now detected them, and we've detected so them... So as the Earth orbits around the star, a ripple, ripple effect occurs through space-time, so other, pl every planet's cascading this gravitational wave, and we're so, now sensing so, this. So, so what we detected was, initially, was, was two orbiting black holes, orbiting each other, and that was actually sending ripples through space-time itself. Mm -hmm. So that was not an instrument that I know how to build. I don't have access yeah, to black holes. To black hole technology. Exactly. But <laughs> as it turns out, absolutely any mass whatsoever yes. will actuate, will send gravitational waves out. Very small ones. In proportion to the mass. mass yeah. So therefore, I can go get a ball bearing, which is what I've done. Mm -hmm. If you go back a few slides there. Go back to the um, um, What I've done is I've, I've gotten a... One more. I've gotten a some ball bearings of different masses yes. that allow you to actuate at different amplitudes and then frequency maps on to, to acceleration. Oh wait, does, oh, does this... Does you can this, attach one yeah. or another to the cello. And then, this is on a stand and here. Then it, and you, you spin it, it. You take it off the yeah. stand and you move it. And by moving it, oh, you're you just able move to... move it yourself. Right, and by moving it, you're able to change your acceleration because rotation is constant acceleration. So by rotating this mass at different rates, you have control over frequency. By switching one mass for another, you have control over amplitude. Yeah. And you're doing this over time. So you have all of the constituent parts of musicality, but for gravitational waves, which are not accessible to us in the first place, and yeah. certainly not at this level, but what's to say yes. for another being elsewhere in the universe? And so then this then becomes a platform for saying, okay, what happens now when we have all these instruments? What kind of music might we make? 
Well, and if your ear is positioned right next to one point, at least along it, you can maybe hear it come well, by. You so probably end up with a concussion. Yeah, just and in I case. don't want to be liable. So, yeah. but let's, so let's interesting. Not... So, what musical instruments can we make? What omniphonics can we make for the galaxy, for the universe? Right. And how can we expand? Like you said, the Copernican revolution of this, of of of, of understanding that we are not at the center of everything that we think about, and to, to deteriorate yeah, this. And we, and we this identity of tribalism and we, we, we don't know it all we don't experience it all yes and we can be aware of what we don't experience and what we can't experience even and that can open us up and that we can actually interact by those means as well as the means that we can experience yeah and that can be a way in which to have a more open sort of dialogue with fewer assumptions built into it and then we yes. can start making different kinds of music around that we can start thinking about how do we how do we then get rid of cognitive assumptions? How do we get rid of experiential assumptions? What sort of music do we make? What sort of foundations might we use to build some sort of a conversation that is genuinely inclusive? Yes, I love it. Okay, and then a deep time photography, let's touch on this. So you're taking photographs over centuries and millenniums. Yes, so, and Generally speaking, my monologues go over centuries and millennia, so I, I think that I'm sure we're going to run out of, out of time here on this, but I will just say relatively quickly. Why don't you take your time on we'll, uh, we'll, the show and just just stop the stream when you're done. All right, I'll do that. All right, that Jonathan, great to meet you. Um, uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. For Likewise. Being are, you. are you staying on the center cam the rest of the time? Yeah. All right, sounds just, good. But, uh, get yeah. as much from this man as you can. All right, that sounds good. Get All his right. number. Let's hang Sweet. out. Let's go to San. Santa Cruz and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have some oysters. And Be beautiful. I got. I have a sense of time now on, uh, I'll flip the phone up so I can see the time. Ron, have a good time at Star Wars. Thank you. Um, we'll we'll uh, hit these last two points, talk a little bit more, and then we'll also have Jonathan, send Jonathan off. Jonathan, give me one hand, give me a call. Absolutely. We'll, we'll be hanging more soon. All right. Okay. So I'm um, back to um, you also are on a timer at 652. So um, we'll get so, you out the door. So yeah, so let, let's just talk through deep time photography and we can leave future projects for the future. Yes. How does that sound? That sounds great. Okay. So. And the centuries of the bristle cones. So that's yeah. the future. So. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. So we'll leave. Yes. We'll, we'll leave the project that's with the Long Now Foundation, the Nevada Museum of Art, uh, which is a 5,000 year long project. So it makes oh. my. Millennium camera scene yeah. like pocket change. Uh, because the we have time cone on is, that the, one. is the oldest longest living tree. species on the planet, as far as we know. Wow. So, but, so, but aren't like sharks and ocean creatures are older? Reptilians? Well, individual sharks are not living on the order as far as Not one as we shark know. has lived 5,000 years. Exactly, but, but you're talking but about the, one tree. The species, yeah, yeah. Well, so, and I'm not speaking of it as okay, a, as, a, as bacteria as a, as a, would be the species or as whatever. As a species, so um, it's arguable what's okay. the last universal common ancestor. Uh, cyanobacteria has been proposed potentially as being very early on as far as extant species, but no, I'm what, speaking about thing. a single, yeah. right. Yeah. So, this is, that's a good teaser. We're going to cool. turn that into a timekeeping mechanism that's going to ground time in the world as we live it. But right now, what you're looking at awesome. is a camera. Uh -huh. So this is a project that I started some years ago in Berlin, thinking about how every time that I went to Berlin, everything changed gentrification was overtaking the city, but people who lived there were not really able to see that because yes. it was in a constant way yes. that complacency allows for a lot to happen. And so I thought, what mechanism might I be able to use in order like, to be able to... Like, for example, I showed this photo of London from like 1960 mm. to my social network. Yes. And it was a very interesting talking point because it was like, look at what people were wearing. Look at mm -hmm. how many uh, people, look at what the advertisements were like. Look at what the buildings were like. Look at what the transit was like. Yes. And so these were all completely different then. So if you can look, if like, for example, we could take a snapshot of Singapore from 10 years ago and then a snapshot of Singapore Singapore from five years ago and just look at these of the same sphere or maybe the same street view or the same top-down view it would change drastically but if you live there you might not notice it so much and there's been a lot of re-photography which is very interesting in its own right in terms of looking both at cities and at natural environments I, that's actually not at all what I'm doing though I'm very interested in it what I was thinking was what 
might be a way in which to make people more aware of what I refer to as deep time, borrowing a term from geology. What, what might happen if there were some means by which we were being watched by the future? So in, in the case of the city, in the case of Berlin and subsequently other cities, my thought was, what if I were to make a surveillance camera that wasn't the state watching you or your neighbor, but was in fact those who are most affected by the decisions that we make, but at least empowered to have any way in which to shape those decisions, the decisions that ultimately will make the world that they're born into the way that it is. That is to say those not yet born. So the idea was make a camera with a hundred year long exposure and then have a lot of them distributed through the city, watching over whatever happens over that period of time. And then in a hundred years, have an exhibition in which you're able to see not before and after or not moment by moment in terms of segments in time, but the whole change, the, the all of time compressed into a single image. So a movie compressed into a single image. So the idea is basically pinhole camera, a camera that lets in very little light, focusing the light through a pinhole, projecting it not onto ordinary film, which wouldn't go for more than a few years is really the maximum there, but rather onto ordinary black paper that will fade in sunlight. You have a magazine on your coffee table and it will fade in time. Same idea here, but you're projecting light in a focused way. What happens? Well, think about a basketball game where you see the player as kind of a ghost against a backdrop where you see the basket perfectly clearly. So in a sense, what you're seeing is something that is transient, something that is not. And you're able to unpack that picture. There might be an equivalent sort of case in a photograph over a hundred years where a lot of change is going to be seen in ghostly terms, whereas those things that remain constant will actually be quite hard on the exactly. plate. Yep. So it becomes possible to see change. Oh, we've and seen this see, in the long exposure photography of right. people taking photos of maybe the stars yes. and then somebody walks by and they look exactly. like a ghost. Yeah. So, and you have the phenomenon of a, double, of a double negative as well, where you take a snapshot and another one all on the same piece of film. And so there might be an equivalent there where a house gets torn down after 20 years and a big building goes up in its place. You would have the shadow of the house, the ghost of the house and the building that much more strongly in the image. So therefore, you really are allowing the future, at least potentially, to look at the whole period of time. And the cameras are out there in a way that, well, they're surveillance cameras. So I hope they make us a little bit paranoid. And they're hidden. So you don't know when you're being watched. Most of these, of course, are going to fail, if, if not all of them. And I started out with a hundred of them, and they were given to people to be able to distribute throughout the city and to tell a child when they get to be very old or to leave the information in their will so that it gets passed on. Exactly. So it becomes a means by which the next generation then is able to retrieve the cameras and to see, to see the decisions that we made. But it also becomes a way in which we're able to look at our decisions from their vantage potentially. Yes. It's so it's a camera that's looking through time in both directions. It's well, everything documentary photography is not meant to be. Documentary photography is not supposed to interfere. This is interfering. This is a case in which you're being yep. watched and you can change the picture. You can make decisions based on the longer term, based on this whole scope of a hundred years. And it becomes a way in which to see yourself from a de definite point in the future, which is to say not to have that blur that is what leads to the complacency that may, makes for gentrification without thinking it through. And also you have the, the, the ability to, to be in a sort of a dialogue with the far future. So this is something mm -hmm. that in an urban setting can really speak to how you go about making a city of the future or making your city over time for the future. But there's also an even longer term prospect that is possibly even more important. That is to say, how we interact with the environment. The fact is that we are now capable of changing everything on a scale of a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand years in a moment's time. We did not evolve that way. We, did, we evolved with 
the hand axe as our premier technology where you could change the immediate environment around you over a, a period of perhaps years. Now it is on a scale that we just don't have the means by which to understand what we're doing. We don't have the means to be able to use our power responsibly and we've shown that we're incredibly irresponsible with it. So what might be a sort of a technological prosthesis, a means by which to be able to start to think in the sort of deep time that we operate in? So I decided to build a camera with a thousand year long exposure. In that case, it becomes a more challenging prospect. In the 100-year camera, you can use ordinary paper. Paper lasts for 100 years. I can use cheap materials and make them widely available. In fact, I've, I've made a version that's made out of cardboard. You basically cut it out, make it into a cardboard box, poke a hole in it, and most of them won't survive, but the few that do might just be a means by which to see in the future what happened over time, and it remains, even if that doesn't happen, a prompt that we can work on, that we can act on. The fact that there might be a camera watching. The thousand year camera uses 24 karat gold as the material through which the aperture has been punctured. And instead of paper, it uses a Renaissance oil painting technique with a paint that we know is fugitive in terms of its color, mm. but where we know that it's stable in terms of the fact that it will survive on the back of this camera made out of copper. Mm -hmm. So everything is in archeological terms and in art, art historical or conservation, art conservation terms, as validated as can be, well, I don't know what will happen. I can at least say that I have data as a basis for doing this as rigorously as possible to put these cameras out there. And so far there are two of them. One looking out at the city of Tempe from Arizona State University. The second one at Amherst College looking out at the Holyoke Range. So an urban environment over deep time cool. and a so-called natural environment. And it's about to get much bigger and more distributed with four of them that are about to go up in Lake Tahoe, looking at the lake from four different vantages. Good. And we'll take it from there. I'm trying to figure out how to make this into a project for UNESCO, where World Heritage mm -hmm. Sites have these cameras, and also where the simple version of the camera, the cardboard cutout camera, is something that potentially every child gets as a birthright. And yeah. potentially it becomes this iterative, ongoing process, this way in which we're relating through time with future generations. Yes. But there are sentinels that are looking out through time and that we're able to see ourselves from the far future and to then make decisions in a way that are embedded in deep time. Our minds become embedded in deep time while at the same time participating in some sort of deep time by way of this shorter span that is a, just over the verge of what a generation survives to be. And of course, Aubrey de Grey is going to tell you otherwise, and maybe it will be, but then we'll just make it a 200-year camera. <laughs> we can keep upping the yeah, yeah, yeah. gamut in order to keep that dynamic in play. So that's deep time photography. It's a thought experiment as well. And some of the thought experiments, I think, potentially they're funny. I mean, pornography for plants yeah. is probably People laugh, and I think that's a great thing because when you laugh, you're off guard and you potentially have a sort of conversation yes. that you might not otherwise. Yes. Other projects, like the Deep Time Photo Photography Project, are certainly there is some sort of an absurdity inherent in building cameras, an absurd sort of hope, perhaps, and a, but certainly there, there's a realm of disorientation that subsists in the absurd that is a means by which to then reorient that is, I think, inherent in all of these projects and that makes it so that every one of these projects is this sort of a thought experiment that is happening in the here and now but also is a means by which to project ourselves forward to mm -hmm. explore possible worlds and then to make our future more informed collectively, individually, in terms of the experiences that we've had in some sort of a system a systematic play that then makes it so that the future that we actually build is perhaps a future that is better for us than would be the case if we simply were to be complacent, careless, or simply give it over to the political systems that don't seem to be working in our best interest. Jonathan, I'm so grateful to have all of this conversation. And Likewise. I in the way that you describe the importance of deep time photography, um, I think is 
it kind of treats it gets us closer to seeing ourselves in the mirror. And I, we talk about the importance of that so much on the show. Um, this is a very, very long-term mirror it ha- for all of society. It has society. to be a long-term mirror for society. It has to be that way. And there's this long-term mirror that we hold in front of ourselves. And that's kind of this be better than you were yesterday. Mm-hmm. And also future authoring, look at what you want to be in a year, five years, 10 yes. years, how do you get there? And then there's this societal mirror and that like if there's a mirror right by the International Space Station or even further out and we just get to look at it and we're like, damn, like objectively, there are just some things on the planet that we can make better over or time. The mirrors on the moon. The mirrors on the moon. The That's a good one. Astronauts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, in order to be able to actually see ourselves in the mirror objectively over time and like you said, there is this way of doing things like these uh, deep time for t- photographs that can um, that can that can more easily communicate this thought experiment to next generations and for them onward. And I'm really happy that you're working with Long now. There are definitely some people that came to mind that we'll be introducing you to um, that can hopefully accelerate some of this uh, impact into our world. We'll definitely be doing a part two soon. Excellent. I look that, forward to it. I look forward to it as well. So. Maybe we can even do a live event together. That would be a lot of fun as well. Sure, we um, can do a thought experiment. And we can, exactly, that's why I was mentioning mm-hmm. the, I yes. want to pull a freaking confetti shooter out and then I want to throw a beach ball out. You know, these, these are the little thought experiments. These are mm-hmm. very small ones and um, <clears throat> One can even do a whatever, just start with a, a 30 minute pinhole camera, right? You can start mm. with these s- small ones. Um, and experiential play, experimental philosophy, these are really great ways to make ourselves better and understand time more and understand play more, understand the senses that we don't have, the perception mm. that we don't have, the cognition that we don't have. I really love thinking about what senses and cognition has evolved on other planets orbiting stars. Um, Well, make some instruments. Do it all yourself. I'm simply doing it because no one else is. And I'm not any better than anyone else. I'm probably worse than most at most everything that I do. But you got to get started. And ideally, it then brings others into this business of doing experimental philosophy. So I very much hope that happens and let's keep the conversation going. Yes, you have opened that door and I think other people are following through and we've opened the door in many ways and we are exactly like you. We have so many things that go wrong that other people do so much better than us, but we hope to you know, open the door for the big scale sports stadiums, filling those up with curious intellectuals and also um, for creative incubators because how many beautiful ideas are there that don't get talked but or don't get brought into the world because we're fearful or we don't take the risk and there's so many reasons why people don't have the resources they're starving for electricity or food or water so they have to focus on that first um jonathan what a freaking pleasure likewise thank you so much for coming on to the show absolutely we'll pick it up again we'll pick it up again soon thanks everybody for tuning in if you guys had a good time go and talk about experiential philosophy with other people go and start new thought experiments yourself that is so important go and create and document yourself creating it and then go write about it or make a video about it go and create don't just consume with this content also comment below with your thoughts subscribe join the family join the community let's go and start talking about these things more Join us on Patreon. We're trying to sustain this, build it, increase it, its impact. So join us there. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Much love, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.